What's going on everyone, my name is Kodamore and welcome to episode 15 of the New Beginner Java Game Programming Tutorial Series. In this tutorial, we are going to be working a lot with the Entity, Creature, and Player classes to make them more proper and to allow us to do way more things in the future, so prepare for quite a bit of coding. We're going to go ahead and start coding in the Entity class. Now we are going to add two more variables to this class. Instead of just protected flow x and y, which is the coordinate or position of the entity on the screen, we're also going to add a protected integer variables width and height. Now this is going to be the width and height or the size of the entity. And at the end of this video we are actually going to learn how to draw images at different sizes onto the screen. And that's why we need these two width and height variables. So keep these two variables in mind once we get to the end of the video. Next we're going to actually change the constructor of this entity class. Instead of just taking an x and y variable as parameters, we're also going to take an int width and an int height variable as parameters as well. And just like here, we're going to do this dot width equals width and this dot height equals, uh, whoops, equals height. And we're just going to set those variables to the parameters that we have passed in. Now for those of you who just recently began programming, you're going to want to learn and get in the habit of using getters and setters. Now we've actually already used getters in our game. If you go into our game class here and you scroll down to the bottom, as you can see we already have a public key manager get key manager. This is called a getter. And all it is is it's a method that returns a private variable so that other classes can access it. Setters are the same thing, except it takes in a parameter and it sets a private variable. We're going to get into coding that in the Entity class. Now if you're using Eclipse, Eclipse has an awesome feature. If you go on up to Source and then go to Generate Getters and Setters, you can actually select which variables you want to generate getters and setter methods for. That way you don't have to type them yourself. I'm going to want to check all height with x and y because I want getters and setters for all of these protected variables that way other outside classes can access them somehow. And I'm going to go down here and I'm going to select OK and as you can see that's going to generate a bunch of methods. Public float get x, that's just going to return the x variable. Set x is going to take in a parameter x and it's just going to set the variable or the x variable to that. Now these are really simple methods and I'm just explaining them for those of you who haven't really programmed much before. But we are going to be using many many getters and setters. So when I say getters and setters I'm talking about methods like this. And as you can see if you're using Eclipse it automatically generated all of these getters and setter methods for the variables that we've selected x, y, width, and height. That way we didn't have to type them at ourselves. Okay, so we've created a bunch of getters and setters, and we're essentially done with the Entity class for today's tutorial. So now let's head on over to the Creature class, and we'll see that we already have an error that has appeared in the Creature class. Now, that is because our Creature class extends the Entity class, and we just changed the Entity class's constructor to also take in an int width and an int height variable. So, in our Creature class, we're just going to do the same thing. We're going to take in an int width and an int height variable like so. Let me spell that correctly. And where we call the super method, which simply calls the entity class's constructor, we're going to pass along those width and height parameters that we've just added. And that should get rid of the error because now everything works with the entity class. But we're not done just yet. We are going to add a bunch of variables into this creature class to make it more, I guess, programmer friendly, you can call it. First of all, we set our health variable equal to 10 right here in the creature constructor. Now, to make things, I guess, a little bit more proper, what we're going to do instead is at the top of this creature class here, we're going to create a few public static final integer variable, and we're going to call it default health. And we're just going to set that equal to 10. And I'm making it a final variable, that way we cannot change the default health, because this is a health that everything is going to start with, but we can easily change it for any creature as we're programming. This is just what we're going to initially set every single creature's health to. That means, down here in the creature class, we're just going to set our health variable equal to the default health variable that we just created. Now we have one more thing. Every creature should be able to move. That means every creature is also going to need a speed, a speed to move at how fast it should move. So right below this integer health here, I'm going to create a protected uh, float, of course, because we're working with a position, a protected float, and I'm going to name it speed. And just like our health variable, I'm going to create a public static final float variable, and I'm going to name it default speed. So the default or initial speed that we're going to set every creature to. But again, we can easily change it for separate entities or for separate creatures while programming. I'm going to set the default speed to 3.0f, so to 3. And in our constructor of our creature class here, we are going to set speed equal to, you guessed it, 
default speed. But we're not done just yet. Firstly, we're going to go ahead and up to source and we're going to select generate getters and setters again. And we're only going to generate getters and setters for health and speed, which are the two only protected variables in our class. Go ahead and generate those, or you can of course type them in yourself. Get health, set health, get speed, and set speed. That way we can access those variables from outside classes. Now we have one final thing for now to do inside of this creature class. What we're going to do is, where we declare all these final variables up here, we're going to create two more public static final integer variables, and this is going to be called default creature width. Default creature width, and I'm going to set that equal to 64. Of course, you can set it to any size that you want creatures to defaultly be. So what size should every creature be given just to start with? Now I want everything in my game to be square because I'm going to be making a tile based game. So square tiles, square creatures makes sense. And I want 64 pixel and then I'm also going to create a default creature height variable and I'm going to set that to 64 as well. So I want 64 pixel by 64 pixel creatures to be drawn to the screen. And of course, if I want a creature to be bigger, we can of course change that after, but this is just to have something a bit constant that we can rely on. But again, if you want your creatures to be 16 pixels by 16 pixels mainly, you can set it to 16. And again, you're gonna get what I mean in just a second when we go ahead and switch on over to the player class. So switch on over there and you're gonna see that our player class now has an error in it, and that's because the constructor of our creature class now takes in a width and a height. Now, we aren't actually going to change the player's constructor. I know that my player is going to be the default creature width and height. So, when we call the super method here, we are going to call the creature class, and we're going to do creature dot default creature width, and then as a second or as a fourth parameter, creature dot default creature height. And I'm just using those two static final, and of course they're public, so I can access them like that. And I'm, I'm accessing them and I'm passing them in as parameters for the width and height. So my player is going to be a size of whatever these two variables are, which in my case is 64 pixels by 64 pixels. Okay, so now let's see what progress we've actually gained here. So go ahead and run your game, and everything should work just perfectly. I can still move it, and it looks the exact same. Except, wait a second, let me, let me bring this up again. My creature here, you can't really tell by the video, but this is only 32 pixels by 32 pixels. But I specified my player to be 64 pixels by 64 pixels, because I used the default creature width and default creature height. Well, that brings me to the next kind of only exciting thing in this tutorial, and that's how to draw images to the screen at different sizes. And it's actually extremely simple to do. Down here in our render method, when we do g.drawImage, after we specify x and y, we're just going to pass in the width and the height of this player. And again, we have access to these width and height variables because we extend creature and we extend entity and they're protected variables. So what we do is instead of just xy null, we have xy, then the width that you want to display your image at, the height that you want to display the image at, and then we still need null because we don't really care about that parameter. Now if you go ahead and run your game, you're going to see that the cre or your player is going to be much bigger if you set it at a bigger size, or it's going to be much smaller if you set it at a smaller size. So this is actually quite a bit more exciting. And just to show you guys that it works, I'm going to take away these two parameters right here, and I'm going to make it a wacky size, like say 100 150 pixels wide by uh, 20 pixels high and if we go ahead and run our game our player is really oddly shaped so now we can actually scale or draw images at different sizes in our game and like I said that's really the only exciting part of this tutorial but we still have more to do so I'm gonna reset that to default creature width and height and now we should just have a bigger creature here or a bigger player and everything is working Fine. But now we have to tweak our movement system and how we do movement in our game. Now since every creature should have the option to move, we are going to begin making our movement code inside of the creature class here. Now I'm just going to be encoding and I'm going to kind of explain it after I program it, although I'm going to try and explain it as I go on, but just follow along here. I'm going to create two more variables. Of course, they're going to be protected and they're going to be floats because we are going to be dealing with movement. And I'm going to call them X move and Y move. And inside of the creature constructor here, I'm just going to automatically set these X move and Y move um, 
variables equal to zero just to begin with. And before I forget, and I know a lot of you are probably getting mad that I'm doing this, but head on up, generate getters and setters for that X move and Y move variable that we just created. Like I said, you want to get in the habit of creating uh, getters and setters for most of your variables. So there we go, I just added the get X move, get Y move, uh, set X move, and set Y move. So we have a bunch of getters here. And I'm just gonna make a comment here to say that anything below here is getters and setters, and I'm going to now begin coding a method right here. What I'm going to do is it's going to be a, uh, uh, we'll make it public, it's going to be a public void method called move, and it's going to take in no parameters. All this move method is going to do for right now is it's going to take the x coordinate of the creature and it's going to add whatever the x move variable equals. And we're going to do the same for y. We're going to add to the y variable whatever the y move variable equals, like so. So the move method is extremely simple. It's just going to add uh, whatever the x move variable is to the x variable or the x coordinate position of the creature and do the same for the y position of the creature. Now switch on back to your player class here and we are going to completely redo the way that we get input and all of that fancy stuff. I'm going to create an, uh, a method below here and it's going to be private void and I'm going to name it get input. This is going to be responsible for managing or handling anything that input should do. For instance, when we press the arrow keys or WASD keys, how to move the player. In this get input method, we first have to set the X move variable equal to zero and the Y move variable equal to zero. And again, we can access those because they're protected and we extend the creature class. It is very important that every time you call the get input method, you set x and y move back equal to zero. Now we're going to go ahead and get our keyboard input. So I'm going to do it the same way that we did last time. So if game dot get uh, key manager dot up. So if the player should be moving up, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the y move variable because moving up is along the y axis, and we have to subtract from our y coordinate. So I'm going to set the y move variable equal to negative our speed. Remember that speed variable that we created towards the middle of this video? Yeah. So we want to set the y move variable equal to negative speed because we're moving up the y axis and remember the y axis is kind of flipped around in computer graphics. So we're setting that y move equal to negative speed. And I'm going to go ahead and copy this down three more times. Hopefully you guys can try and do this on yourself if you want to go ahead and try it, do that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to check if the down key is being pressed or we're going down, then we want to add to the Y move, or I'm sorry, add to the Y coordinate. So we're going to set our Y move variable equal to speed. And don't worry, you're going to get this towards the end of the video. And I'm going to do the same for left, if, if we're pressing the left variable, then we want to set X move because moving to the left is along the X axis. And we want to set it equal to negative speed because we're going to be moving towards the left of the X axis, which is decreasing. And we're going to do finally the same thing for right. If we should be moving right, then we're going to take our x move and just add regular speed because we're going right across the x axis. So instead of directly affecting the x and y coordinates of our player, we're instead setting our y move and x move variables equal to a certain speed, either our speed or negative speed, depending upon the direction we should be moving along which axis, based on what key we're pressing, of course. So in our tick method here, we first have to call our get input method, and that is going to effectively set the x move and y move variables to what they should be. It's going to set them equal to zero first, but if we're pressing a key, it'll set it equal to negative speed or speed or something like that to move along the axes correctly. Now if you run your game now and you try pressing uh, your WASD or arrow keys, nothing is going to happen. But that's where our new move method is going to come in. After we get input, we are going to call the move method. And this move method is available to us from the creature class. And the creature class utilizes the x move and y move. That's why we set those variables in our get input method. So if I go into my player here and I set, uh, say I'm pressing the down arrow key, I'm setting the y move equal to speed. So if we go into the creature class, our speed is equal to default speed, so to 3. That means our y move is equivalent to 3. Whenever we call the, the move method here, it's going to increase our y variable by 3 because our x, or I'm sorry, our y move would be equal to 3. If I'm, say, pressing the left key, though, it's going to set x move equal to negative speed. So it's going to set the x move variable equal to negative 3. That means our x value is actually going to get decreased by 3 because when you add a negative number, it's really just like subtracting. 
And that's all basic math. I'm hoping that you can all walk yourself through that and get all the addition and subtraction that's happening there and how all these methods are being called. But now that we added that move method call in here and we select uh, run our game, everything now works as proper. Now we didn't get much of a change. I mean, sure, our player looks at like a different size, but the movement is exactly the same. But we fixed the movement so that it's more object oriented in a way and it's more proper than just doing everything in the player class. So we did quite a bit of coding today, only in the entity, creature, and player classes. We made things much more proper. We learned a lot about getters and setters and we used a lot of them and we learned how to scale or resize the way images are drawn to the screen. This has actually been a really exciting tutorial for me to make. I really enjoyed making this episode. If you guys have any questions, if you're confused about anything at all, leave a comment down below. Either I or someone helpful in the comments will answer your question or hopefully make you understand something a little bit better. So thanks for watching everyone and I'll see you guys in the next episode.